Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds, to another spring edition. It is the early part, late part of winter, early part of spring, if you will. And a lot of questions about spring migration. And I have addressed that uh, just recently on programs. But generally, when people are asked questions about spring migration, it's because they're really excited about what will be, what will be coming into your area. Now, remember, I am in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm in the heart of the country. So when I'm talking about birds and the dates and things like that, when it comes to migration, if you're north of me, or you've got to add a few days, if not a couple of weeks, and if you're south of me, it, it, you may be ahead of me by a couple of weeks. But the subject, this, this program was inspired more by those questions of when are my juncos leaving? When are you know my white throated sparrows going to leave? And, and 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 you know those northbound. And, and I realize I've never done a, a migration video about that part of migration. It's always about when are the hummingbirds coming in, when are the purple martins coming in, things like that. So today we're talking about those birds that will be exiting uh, your area if they haven't already, and some of these may be already on the move. So. First, let's put the, the star of the day up because that's the bird that inspired the program, and that is the dark-eyed junco. Um, this is a slate-colored junco, and in, in different parts of the country, there are different color forms of this bird. There's the Oregon junco, which has the the, the black hood look to it, and uh, like in the mountains, and there's red-backed juncos, and there, there's there's other other species around that maybe they 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 all do tend to migrate some, maybe with the exception of the white-winged juncos in South Dakota, they they tend to be pretty sedentary. But the we we know affectionately this birds by uh, the nickname snowbird because they do come, they do escape the great white north, and I mean way north, uh, and and settle into the usually the middle part of the lower 48, even the southern states are all through, but they, they know that the, the ground's not going to be covered with snow. They've been here feeding under your feeders probably all winter, along with a lot of other birds. But they are the birds that kind of symbolize that uh, fall migration at the start of winter when they come in, and they're a real favorite of bird people and bird feeders. So when will your juncos be leaving? Remember when I talk, if you've watched any of my videos, when I'm talking about migration, I tell you that it, weather has only a little bit to do with it, a bird's ability to migrate because uh, they can't fly against the wind for the most part. But the mechanism for triggering when to start migrate, migration has to do with internal instincts, and that is day length. It's the most important. When days start getting longer, then birds internally, it triggers them to know that it's time to start their migrate north to go back to their nesting territories. Um, you, they, they know that if they try too early, like if we have a really warm snap, and we often do in the middle of January, why don't they leave then? If it was all weather related, well, it isn't because they know uh, that you know, if they leave too early, their chances of returning to a still snow covered environment with no insects to raise their babies and their seed sources still be covered up by snow. So it's day length that drives them. And that's why migrations each year pretty much fall into line uh, as to when they leave and when they arrive because they it, it is an instinctual migration for them. So juncos will be leaving pretty much right on time, which now but they'll start thinning out pretty soon and they'll gradually make that trip north. And then some of these birds, I, I tell the story of one that was banded uh, here in Kansas City several years ago. Okay several years ago, and that bird had been banded. It, it was found dead uh, at, 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 at a house, and it hit a window at a house 100 miles north of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is a very far way north. And so this bird was banded in Kansas City, and it died that far north. You could bet it, it was going, that's its migration, and it nests somewhere up there further than 100 miles north of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, uh, but it was it winters down here in, in the Kansas City area. And they know that bird was at least 11 years old, and it had been recaptured at least a couple of times in Kansas City with banding operations. So that bird, for at least 11 years, had been going making that migration route. So, But it, it they do it 
pretty much that same period of time because of daily. We've all, it, it, if you grew up like I did watching Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom and shows like that, and the videos of the, the, the geese and the swan and everything getting back too early or getting back uh, to their nesting grounds and the lakes are all frozen over and they're landing and sliding on the ice, things like that. That can happen because weather is definitely unpredictable. And, you know, if, if so they, 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 they daily triggers them, but it may fool them sometime and they have to survive until the, the ground falls and they can get on with their nesting. So Junko is the prime example, but, but that's not the only one I wanted to talk about today because there's something I want you to be looking for. And that is as these birds that have spent the winter here, like this Harris's sparrow, uh, right before they leave, they're molting into their breeding plumage. And it's one of the most entertaining times to see these beautiful birds. This is what they look like when they get here in the fall. And they've looked like this pretty much all winter. But look at the difference between that and what they look like right before they leave. And I've seen them up, oh, the first week of May into the, uh, the 10th, 15th of May here in the Kansas City region. So they will stay a good while and they're molting and they start to sing, which is we don't get to hear these birds sing very often. But that last you know, little time period right before they migrate uh, either through the area or, or from our area, the Harris Sparrow is in his breeding plumage, and you really would like to see that because it, that beautiful silver side of the face versus this, the tans and browns and a little bit of black on top, but they, they transform. And not only that, another bird is probably more familiar to you in your backyard are the white-throated sparrows, and they have the white stripes and, and tan stripes, either white or tan stripes on their on the sides of their face and on the top of their head, but that those yellow lures, those yellow spots right above the eyes will get much, much brighter uh, at moving into the breeding season. So right before they leave, they're much more brilliantly colored than probably you've seen them all winter. So that's something to look forward to right before migration. And a bird that a lot of people, some people don't think of migrating uh, but because they do uh, molt into two different plumages. They went, goldfinches have a different plumage in winter, much more olive color and bright yellow. But at least in this part of the country, uh, and uh, we get a lot more in winter. So if you guys live up to you know Nebraska and the Dakotas and, and, and Southern Canada, you probably lose most, if not all, of your goldfinches in winter to, to this part of the country, again, because of, they know the food availability. But what my typical pattern in my yard uh, it, it has been that all the way through maybe the last week of March, I'll have a lot of American goldfinches. And then, boy, between that last week of March up until first week of April, boom, they, they thin out incredibly. And those are a lot of those birds that are moving back north. And so you guys up to the north, have you know, look forward to seeing them return uh, to their nesting grounds up there, uh, usually around the first of April for a lot of people. And this bird on the right here, especially, is still molting. You can see on the back of his head there, some of those still those olive drab feathers. So that's a, a, a transition. It's going to be happening here uh, here in the next couple of weeks. We're going to see them starting to leave in this area. Uh, other birds that will be moving through. Now, some of you may have had a, a yellow-bellied sapsucker, uh, this bird here. Uh, at your feeders all winter. Um, a lot of those birds pass through. I see them in, oh, in the early part of winter. And then during the, mi the middle of winter, I don't see hardly any of them. But boy, here in the spring, they're moving back through. And some of, some yellow belly sap suckers go as far as uh, Central America uh, in their fall migration and spend the winters down there. Some only go to the lower U.S. and places like that. But it's always uh, fun to watch them come back through. And they are much more colorful in the spring like this guy you can really see the yellow on his belly where he gets his name from uh, this is a male we know because he has a red throat uh, and a handsome bird and uh, they'll start moving through and so keep your eye on that there are not many woodpeckers that migrate most woodpeckers are pretty sedentary um, you know the exception maybe being red red-headed woodpeckers that move around because of acorn crops and yellow belly sap suckers are true migrants so they're going to be coming through anytime now uh, and we'll see them up through migrating through because they don't nest in our area. They're going to nest up much further to the north, um, especially in, you know, the piney forest of the north. And these guys are, are, you know, will be moving through really through now through, well, the middle of May. 
they're going to still be passing through the area. So be watching for those. And another bird that you may have had during the winter months, but come through a pretty good numbers in, in the spring are the cedar waxwings. They, some of these will, these will, uh, winter as far south as Costa Rica and some of those countries uh, down there near the equator, uh, some will winter right here in Kansas City. It is hard to know, but they will uh, come through in bigger numbers. So watch for these flocks of cedar waxwings moving north to get back to their nesting territories. And yes, some of them do nest here in, in Missouri, but not a lot, not compared to the north. So and other birds that you may be glad to see leaving uh, is a sharp shin hawk. Uh, we don't have a lot of sharp shin nests in the state of Missouri, uh, and, and, and there are not much there are many nests in the southern. Maybe some of the southern states that have a lot of pines. There may be more to the east, but in our area, sharp shin hawks don't nest in our area. Cooper's hawks nest all over, but we we get invaded by the sharp shin hawks from the north uh, in in October, and they stick around and you know, terrorize our bird feeders and and. and small birds around the area, but they're starting to pull out now. So we see less and less of sharp shins and they won't remain in our area for nesting. That just depends on where you are from north or south as to, you know, what the timing of that will be. But now is the season, you know, here toward the end of March and early April, those, those guys are really leaving. And that's true also of red tail hawks. This is an immature red tail. You can tell by the striped tail there, but Red tail hawks, a lot of our uh, resident birds are pairing up and, and, and building on nests and maybe some of them have eggs yet. But a lot of red tails that move out of the northern states uh, and to the south because of the harsh uh, conditions up there and they come through here. Boy, we have a lot of red tail hawks in December in our area and then less in, in January and February. But now they're moving back through and they're on, your, on their way north. Uh, to time their nesting with food availability and unfrozen ground for the most part. So red tails are on their way back north as well, something you may not think of as a migrant. And of course, waterfowl. Uh, this is about a million snow geese in this picture taken here in Missouri. And of course, they they spend the winter down here in points south uh, where there's, there's dependably unfrozen water during the winter months. And they are right now in the process of moving north uh, that, that happened for the last couple of weeks, uh, even maybe up to a month, they've been starting their migration north and they go as far north as they can find on frozen water. And then they'll go further and they'll move, they're making their way up. They'll go up all the way to the edge of the Arctic tundra for, the, for nesting. So uh, waterfowl as a whole, that's just not geese, but ducks and swans and everything are on the move. So we uh, uh, spring migration, it's moving north and, and you know, those guys, they have to uh, time their migration to when they're going to be hitting their uh, their nesting grounds, whenever it's going to be maximizing their food availability for their babies. And so they are triggered by day length, uh, just like those hummingbirds in Central America that are starting to make their way north here in our area. These birds that are here, they've got to do the same thing headed north. So Spring migration and northward bound for uh, our winter residents is the topic today. Thanks for the idea for the program. If you liked it, please give us a like, give us a share. And if you're on YouTube, please subscribe. Until then, come on, let's talk birds.